So welcome back. We're here today in the Money View Reading Group uh, on our final discussion of the world in depression, 1929 to 1939, by Charles Kindleberger. And as usual, um, we uh, assume you've done the reading um, and we will go through the final chapters of this book to uh, kind of recap what we understood, what stood out to us uh, and bring out sort of doubts and observations to each other. Uh, and go right into the text if, ne if necessary. And with that, um, I think we have a sign today. We didn't really get to chapter nine. I forgot to reread it, so I can't really recap it so well for you, but I think uh, we had chapter 10, the beginnings of recovery, uh, chapter 11, the gold block yields, chapter 12, uh, the 1937 recession, uh, 13, Rearmament in a disintegrating world economy. And 14 was the concluding chapter. So uh, just wondering where do we want to start the conversation? Does anybody have something to start us off with, maybe uh, on the overall concluding chapters? Do you want me to recap chapter nine? Yeah, sure. That would be helpful, actually. Yeah. Yeah, so chapter nine, uh, you're in 1933. They're um, getting ready for the World Economic Conference uh, in London. And this is the year that uh, FDR gets nominated um, and the United States uh, goes off gold. Um, so that's all happening while they're preparing for the conference. Um, it ends up being that um, there's kind of this side negotiation about stabilizing currencies that happens right before the conference and it all falls apart. Uh, and then nothing uh, really happens in the conference except for some agreements about uh, uh, silver, um, uh, buying silver on the open market uh, internationally. Um, so, yeah, that's kind of like the the broad overview um, that leads uh, into uh, the United States going into this experiment of um, buying up gold. First, they're buying up domestic gold and um, they're trying to buy it at a price that's higher than the market price to drive up the price of gold to um, to raise uh, other prices. They're hoping that by pushing up the price of gold, they're going to raise other prices. Um, and by the end of the year, they uh, just decide to settle at a new, a new number, which is uh, $35 for an ounce of gold. Um, so there's lots of drama and there's lots of like names in this uh, chapter. Uh, for me, when I was trying to get through this chapter, um, I actually created a spreadsheet of all the different characters and like links to their Wikipedia pages uh, to keep track of who's who, because I'm really bad at, at keeping track of names. Um, so I found that um, after this chapter, it got a lot easier because they weren't doing as much of that stuff. There, were, there weren't like just so many like um, different people with different perspectives, you know, like and kind of calling back to other people. But um, yeah, it's a kind of a failed uh, World Economic Conference um, in 1933, and it kind of uh, sets the tone for what comes next. I, we don't, I don't know if we really need to get into it more than that, if anyone has any comments to add. I remember that Larissa had a specific comment on Germany, since it dovetails my, um, my thesis uh, on Schacht. Um, the only thing I'd like to say is um, that obviously Germ we're already seeing the beginning of, um, of the disintegration, which we'll go get to uh, later. So we're looking at, um, as Alex was saying, the gold standard being the the thing that creates coherence in the in the world mo monetary system, uh, and that is of course now starting to disintegrate in various different ways. Um, now every country on their own uh, is sort of the the recipe here. Every block on their own. Uh, everybody's trying to solve the problem uh, slightly differently. Um, and the German case is particular. Germany is in a full-on deflationary mode, but also uh, in a in, in sort of an experimentation of work creation. Uh, it's not at the scale that Schacht does later with the Mayfield bill that I explained, but all the ideas of having um, uh, work creation bills being introduced already here, and that's also what uh, Schacht, the German central banker uh, under Hitler, then builds his uh, his ideas and frameworks on. So. Um, yeah, that's all, all I'll say. And I think we can get into the stuff a bit later. Um, I'll just 
add one more thing about chapter nine that kind of continues into the following chapters, which is that um, uh, Kindleberger does not have a high opinion of FDR and Henry Morgenthau, who's the treasury secretary at the time, um, knowing what they're doing. Uh, he basically frames it as in they got lucky and made some of the right decisions and they made some of the wrong decisions also. And they were, they were clueless the whole way. It's kind of how he's framing it. Yeah, I think that's, that's exactly right. I couldn't help but uh, read the disdain in every sentence that Morgenthau is mentioned in. So um, yeah, that was in all the chapters. Yeah, I think that there are a couple of places where it was just like, LOL. Um, Jay, because I think what I had been wanting to hear more on is like, what is it? Why did they push? Like, what was the thesis of pushing deflation so hard? So I didn't think this is, best, but this is, was more like trailing off of the, um, what was happening like before like 33, 34. Yeah, that's a good question. I don't think I have a very good and clear answer because there are different positions. I think the Brinning administration has framed it publicly. And I think it was in their thinking that it was inevitable. And I think there was really very little policy space to do otherwise. Um, um, it does, and Germany I think is highly influenced. This administration is still highly influenced by wanting to solve the reparations question. And the repra I think the repra reparations question, I think Kuhnberg identified this too, was still kind of not, didn't allow a complete autonomy of Germany on, its, on the monetary front. Uh, plus uh, with other countries, um, with other countries starting to go off gold, um, on the one hand, all the liabilities of Germany were becoming a bit uh, more bearable, uh, on at least on some of the liabilities. So, but then of course the Germany, German's export sector was suffering. So these are the trade-offs Germany was trying to figure out, but they went also under Schacht later on, around, on the route of trying to subsidize exports rather than trying to play with the exchange rate as such. Um, and they were trying to control the flows per se and not try to have sort of an indirect measure, an indirect uh, influence of these flows through the exchange rate. So yeah, I don't have a good answer to why Germany was pushing for deflation, but I think in people's minds, it was uh, it was almost an inevitable um, outcome of the circumstances. There were too many uh, variables pointing to this, uh, this scenario. Um, but yeah, I'll leave it at that for now. At, at some point, he says there are there are three options for bringing prices back to equilibrium. And one is deflation. Another is depreciation of your currency. And then the third one is having some sort of um, like import controls or, or uh, currency controls or something like that. Um, so then the question we can... Uh, maybe narrow the question down to why did Germany choose this path among the three possibilities? Um, my, my hunch is that, you know, they hadn't had that hyperinflation that long ago and it just politically nothing else was an option or something like that. That point about hyperinflation is definitely, uh, the inflation question was uh, super large in that conversation too. Uh, you're absolutely right. There was another barrier. If you let go of uh, the exchange rate, you have an immediately an inflationary pressure, which would be very uncomfortable uh, given the hyperinflation that was less than a decade away. Um, yeah, I think, yeah, I think uh, we'll get to that discussion a bit later too when we're talking about what happened under Schach because it sort of continues, but in a slightly different version of, uh, of how um, the conversation is set up because, yeah, I don't have a, a very, clear answer but if, if you look at every issue i think it all there's always a very good argument for why uh, the deflation was upheld and continued i think um would have been very difficult um to do so and then you see also the italians there it was a mention i didn't know this but the italians uh, mussolini had um really that really the national identity was uh, su su starting to be really identified with and the nationalism was rallied around the, the strong currency so that's that's another uh, indicator um, for how people have thought. Even though the Bruning administration was not yet full on in this in this uh, 
nationalistic uh, mindset, but I think that's starting to emerge uh, how the exchange rate uh, makes people self-reflect. So yeah, anything else on chapter nine? I still look skim through because I don't have it present anymore, what was all covered. And that's the thing for Sam, just remember <laughs> you're listening in. It's a really dense reading. There's so many little facts and details that we're sitting through. So there's a lot of stuff to abstract from, um, which I'm why I'm looking forward to the final chapter because I think um, he actually does a good, a good uh, has a very good summary of what his main point is of the book. I don't think I have anything else that's specific to chapter nine. Okay. So chapter 10, it is then. Um, oh, one actually quick question. Why, why was it that the US was also so hesitant in talking about reparations and was so keen on like separating reparations and war debt? or then allowing war debt to be part of the World Economic Conference. So that piece, like I wasn't quite sure on like the, was it just like they wanted to get paid and it would be like domestically unpalatable? Like, it seems like that there's that current of thinking. That seems like the obvious answer, but I don't know if there's, if anyone has any other thoughts. My sense is that intuition is right, that they wanted to get paid and they didn't want to like renegotiate the debts from the allies and they didn't see this as a war debt problem. They saw it as like, okay, we need to solve these economic conditions. Uh, and um, what they took the word financial out of the, the description of the conference because they didn't want, you know, kind of war debts yeah. to be implicated in there. Um, it but it yeah, seems I mean, like it would, yeah. No, of course it's all related, right? Because uh, you know the UK was saying, "Hey, we'll um, if if our our war debts uh, get forgiven by the United States, we'll forgive the reparations uh, that Germany owes us," right? Um, so so it is it is connected, um, but the United States was pretending like it wasn't. Um, yeah, I don't know if there's any. Um, I don't know. There's that. I guess then this is. Yeah. I was just going to say there was that bizarre um, uh, letter that was put out by Roosevelt where he kind of um, explains all this weird uh, stuff that doesn't kind of add up. Um, so, so I don't know, uh, you know, like the uh, the intergenerational debt, but he's, you know, responding to the stock market on a day-to-day -day basis or something, you know, like, yeah. Yeah, I guess this just like points to the, in Kindleberger's argument around like, oh, it's really critical for there to be leadership. He's putting um, like specific, he's like naming names, you know, to the point of him not having a high opinion of Roosevelt and, and Morgenthau. It's so like, these were the, like, these are the specific leaders that failed and they failed in this way. And like, um, by looking inward and failing to broaden the conversation. Yeah, and talking about individuals, um, I'm not in the, I'm really curious about the design of the Marshall Plan that this is much later, of course, uh, uh, this is after World War II, but Morgenthau was also deeply involved in that discussion. And I know that Kindleberger was one of the architects uh, or one of, at least not, a, what, not architects, but he was deeply involved uh, in, the, in, the, in the Marshall Plan. Uh, and you might recall what the Morgenthau plan was, which was the counter proposal. Do you, are you all aware of that? Basically, uh, the Morgenthau plan, which was the counter plan to the uh, Marshall plan, was to deindustrialize Germany completely and take it back to the 19th century and make it an uh, agricultural society to basically make Germany a buffer zone um, completely without any economic might. Um, and uh, sort of take it out of, so this is the old sort of almost, what was it the Vienna conference of 1815 uh, to uh, somehow keep Germany as a buffer zone to, in order to keep uh, the global stability intact uh, and not allow Germany to, to return 
uh, as, a, as a destabilizing force on the global arena. And obviously this made little sense to Kindleberger and others. And I think that's also where his disdain for Morgan Thomas be coming from, but I'm just speculating because uh, I think they've clashed on numer numerous fronts. That's actually good context because it also explains, you know, in, in Germany's big push, you know, for deflation, proving that, <laughs> proving that it could not ever possibly pay reparations. Like it explains why that wasn't necessarily persuasive or may not have been persuasive if they're not concerned with like Germany as a going concern and if like the collapse of the country is not seen as a problem. Yeah, it's an interesting question. Um, how much did they see and just not care about um, I guess is, is kind of what you're asking there. Um, yeah. I actually have a few um, comments that I'm not sure I'm not sure are associated with any particular chapter, um, but I thought were interesting. Um, so uh, in, at one point he talks about how um, if all the countries devalue at once, then that alleviates some deflationary pressure and allows, you know, there's more gold for everyone to spend, um, you know, assuming you're staying on the gold standard, but everyone's just kind of like adjusting their, uh, their price of gold upwards, right? Um, so that's uh, inflationary. But then if only, you know, a few countries are doing it, uh, then it's deflationary. When I first read that, um, I thought it was weird. Uh, but then I started thinking about uh, balance sheets. Um, so if you have, uh, if you have an economy where all of the agents, you know, write off, you know, uh, or write down half the debt on their balance sheets and it's evenly distributed, um, then that kind of is a wash uh, and there's no problem there. But if only some people are writing down their debt, now you have um, people who are uh, not getting uh, cash inflows that they thought they were going to get, um, you know, uh, certain balance sheets are um, you know, the net worth is going negative, you know, that kind of thing. Um, so you have this kind of uh, disordered uh, uh, deleveraging if it's not everyone doing it at once. So I think that's why the deflationary effect dominates if you, if only a few countries or some countries or not all at the same time are, are devaluing uh, their currencies because um, other people have that currency, other countries have that currency on their balance sheet or, or, or um, uh, private actors in, in other countries have, have that money on their balance sheet. So um, that's kind of how I made sense of that. Does that make sense? And then if you're, if, if everyone's devaluing against gold, if the entire system is devaluing against gold, um, that allows everybody to, to print money without running a deficit. Uh, and there was this strong aversion to uh, running unbalanced budgets to, um, you know, uh, uh, propping up uh, the price level or propping up demand through um, through deficits. Um, and it feels like, you know, in a kind of a, you know, if you're not thinking in a gold standard context, uh, it, it almost feels like, well, that's that's the obvious solution to deflation is, is to print more money. Um, but but they didn't want to do that. So they tried to find these other these other ways, these other paths. Yeah, this, this last point I think is worth exploring, like the psychology of the gold standard and going off of it. Um, that's, I think we, I don't think we fully appreciate what that meant at the time or what kind of, um, I think it's interesting that he in general associates or that he's so interested in this period. And he obviously is drawing, drawing the connection to the seventies um, where we're about to have a breakup of Bretton Woods, where we also go to some sort of disorganized uh, system. So this book was written in what seventy two. Forget seventy three. It's probably written in seventy one seventy two. Seventy three published. Yeah, you're right. So it's seventy one, seventy two, something like that. So, and I guess he's worried again about 
lack of leadership, which then occur. U.S. is sort of not leading; it's sort of letting the system slide. Um, and I think he's trying to build those, uh, draw those analogies uh, to to that period. But I don't think that Kindleberg could have anticipated really what happens afterwards, right? He, I don't think he imagined that going off Bretton Woods would lead to whatever happened. I think he was anticipating uh, depression, right? <laughs> I think that's what he was worried about writing writing this. Um, so the question I think also is like, okay, what what is the psychology? Because you also get these distorted reactions, these national re reactions you can't anticipate, right? Uh, the French going completely ballistic on just hoarding gold. Um, the uh, UK basically looking completely inward and just, you know, having an empire preference. United States, unsure what, what its role is. It's also like more uh, inward, inward looking in Germany, of course, doing going off a completely different path as well. It's, um, I think it's a pretty unpredictable path. It's true. I think it's really, you don't know what will happen or how, how things will play out. Uh, and the, the connection he's drawing is, of course, that things have somehow facilitated war and conflict, right, between nations. Um, that's what he's also worried about as a former uh, intelligence officer. I think he has that hat on as well. Maybe we just got lucky that Bretton Woods didn't lead to that or the collapse of Bretton Woods. Well, sure, but then the question is, um, you know, what, you know, what, maybe we got lucky, but what, what was going on? What was the mechanism there that would have led one way or another or something like that, you know? If we want to add a book to the reading list, Jeffrey Garden had just published uh, Three Days at Camp David to celebrate the 40 years from the um, Bretton Woods collapse. And like his argument, despite the, the move being multilateral, like unilateral on the part of the, the US, there was significant work afterwards to uh, um, create and ensure some like multilateral cohesion within the system. So I don't think that, I mean, at least Jeffrey Gardner's interpretation is that there was definitively um, a look outwards um, post this definitively inward um, and self-interested um, step. Yeah, uh, that's interesting. Um, I, I also wonder if it has to do with kind of what we were just talking about, about everybody devaluing at once. So if, you know, if you're on a gold standard and, you know, you find a huge amount of gold, right? Um, that's kind of the equivalent to everyone devaluing at once. Um, if, if, if the dollar is your gold, if the dollar is your international money, and then something happens with the dollar, that affects everyone at the same time. And maybe there's some incentives to no longer peg to the dollar or something like that, but it's not the same kind of pressure uh, that you saw in the Great Depression. And it's not like one country um, going off, uh, you know, one country going off gold would affect gold prices for everyone. And, but one country going off the dollar, you know, the dollar, you know, you know that's not, it's not the same kind of thing. Um, so there's less of this kind of um, almost survival constraint pressure or whatever on the countries when the dollar drops gold, it's just like, oh, maybe we don't want to be on the dollar anymore. Um, uh, and they, some, some might try to, you know, like distance themselves from the dollar or something like that, but it's not this, this sudden, sudden deleveraging deflationary scenario uh, that you would have if some countries go off gold and others don't. Um, we would have a deflationary scenario for, I guess, um, the countries that, that stay in the, in the gold block. Yeah, I think that makes sense. Yeah, I mean, the, 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 go ahead, Larissa. No, because one of the things that I thought was most interesting in Kendall Berger's analysis was the different incentives based on like how, what your size is and, you know, how much of responsibility over the system do you bear? Like the larger you are, the more important important you are to the stability overall. So your calculus is very different 
but in that system where the US is is fundamentally at the the center like there's just one movement and kind of like the incentives for everyone it's kind of like changes the incentives throughout the um for all players yeah and i think what you're talking about is page 301 uh the small countries may be held uh uh to a Kantian uh, categorical imperative, which enjoins them to act only in ways uh, which can be generalized in such circumstances, of course, uh, they would not have withdrawn credits from Austria in the spring of 1931, nor Germany and Britain in the summer, nor from the United States uh, in the autumn. Uh, but the economist chooses between these standards, perhaps on the basis of comparative cost. If the Netherlands had known the cost of leaving its sterling unconverted into gold, it seems unlikely that it would have done so, uh, even at the risk of accelerating the collapse of the pound and deepening uh, of the world depression. Uh, so there's this idea that um, if you're a small, a small uh, player, you want to withdraw all your money from the bank when the bank is collapsing. And if you're, you're a big depositor, then um, if you did that, uh, it would just make you worse off by, you know, you wouldn't be able to get all your money out and you'd, you'd ruin the bank for everyone or something like that. Um, so, so that's kind of how he, he um, you know, the incentive, if you're big, then your incentives are aligned with keeping the system working. If you're small, you can't really affect how well the system's working. So you want to get out if it's about to collapse. Yeah, I, th I think that's exactly right, Alex. That's a good, very good contribution and observation. But also I think just to, to the, the point earlier that you're raising, I think the mechanics of going off gold or devaluating, uh, as you said, at all at the same time, I think that is that is a coordinated effort. I think but the the issue, however, is that different countries will be affected differently. And I haven't really thought through what that means. Like if, if we say, okay, UK, um, France, United States all go off gold uh, or they all devalue in the same way. And France, the one who's holding all the gold, um, I'm not sure they are gonna, they have to be compensated somehow. So it's not a mutual cost sharing arrangement uh, potentially um, of, of bearing that that uh, that cost, but for the, the actors underneath, of course, they're all paying in the respective currency. So they, I think it's not so a matter so much of what they think. Um, I think for people underneath the central bank, it's really irrelevant whether you're on gold or not. Uh, ultimately, be, it only affects how scarce the dollar is or how scarce the uh, you know the credit expansion might be on the basis uh, of what people think the, the ultimate means of settlement is. So, yeah. That's just my two cents here. But I think the international cooperation aspect here of just pooling, I think that came up somewhere as well. I forget the exact page. That's one of the, the main points and takeaways as well with this. You actually mentioned swap lines and, and uh, mutualized uh, responsibility. I think that was an important takeaway. Yeah, I think this is when he's talking about the tripartite monetary agreement. Um, the agreement was the origin of, uh, so so he talks about in some ways it wasn't very effective because no one was committing to anything, but the stuff they were talking about was 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 new and the way of thinking about how they interacted was new. Um, and that this agreement was the the origin of, of the ultimate swaps uh, when the holding is of one another's currency. Um, so that, uh, in 19, and then he's here, which in, in 1937 made Morgenthau break out in, into a cold sweat because it was like kiting a check. Uh, yeah, so, uh, so he definitely slips those little, little barbs in there. Yeah, I think part of um, what was interesting in this piece, and I think it's, this piece I'm just trying to speed read to make sure because I think that the tripartite before they they decide on swap lines they try to create it through stabilization funds right instead of through central banks I think this is the moment and there needs to be like that institutional setup of having it go through the central banks for it to actually work yeah I don't think they ever tried to 
do the stabilization funds. I think it was more like an idea, an idea that was floating around that no one could ever kind of come to an agreement on or something like that, right? If I may, uh, no, there, there was uh, the exchange equalization account uh, in, in the UK, which was sort of a, a hidden treasury uh, account. And, and then the, with the devaluation in the United States, they created the exchange stabilization fund with the profits uh, from, from the devaluation of the gold, the gold revaluation uh, profits. And so yeah, there was an early notion that this should all be run through the fiscal uh, uh, authorities and, and the, the innovation of the 60s was running this mostly through the central bank. So even before uh, Camp David, there was already this well-oiled mechanism that Charles Coombs and his associates on the Golden Foreign Exchange Committee in Basel had uh, innovated that did precisely what gave Morgan Tell the willy while he's just writing up uh, assets and liabilities vis-a-vis -vis one another as a, as a way of uh, at least temporarily bridging uh, imbalances in, 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 the, in the currency uh, market or, or even in the dollar uh, deposit market, uh, which is the work that uh, Catherine Schenk and I uh, did uh, a year or so ago at this stage. So it, 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 looking back from 1931 to 1937, we have a six year gap between the uh, the, this 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 mechanism of the swaps being being used, uh, whereas in in the sixties and seventies the swaps are already there before the Bretton Woods, before Camp David, as central bank swaps precisely. There, there's this famous exchange between. Uh, Barney Frank and uh, Bernanke, where Barney says, uh, you know, where'd you get the money, Ben? You know, when he started the swaps, and he says, well, I've gotten, and then he names the number, which is the Fed balance sheet at the time, I've got 700 billion or, or something like that, which turned out to be a rare case of Bernanke sort of understating the capacity of the central bank, right? It turned out that they were not bound by the current assets and liabilities of the Fed at all. They had, they could go well beyond that and 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 create uh, a, a larger and larger balance sheet as as needed to run the swaps with the ECB and and and, and for other purposes. Wow, that's really great insight. So, but just let's just stick on that. You, you said, what what are the actual bounds? I mean, we 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 had that discussion in the money view symposium. I'm just like to stick with that a little bit. What is like, what is the bound of the Fed in this scenario to create the? And we've always settled it's a political a political constraint that binds at some point, but um, is there an economic constraint? I think we haven't really settled that question fully. And I think we're gonna always come back to that until we until we do. What, what, what would an economic constraint look like uh, in, in uh, making these, right now the, the, the swaps are unlimited. They're not going to be used unlimited, with unlimited uh, capacity, but it's a it's 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 discretion completely with the central banks. Um, just wondering what your thoughts are on that, or anybody. Yeah. So if um, if politics were perfect and we weren't constrained politically, um, you know, there'd have to there'd still have to be some constraint. So what is what is that constraint? Um, I think in my mind, what I like to do is imagine um, 
a country that uh, is not managing its currency well and uh, you know what happens if the Fed offers unlimited uh, swap lines with that country and uh, then they actually go off and, and you know you know take out infinite dollars or something like that. Um, I suppose eventually you'd uh, devalue the currency so much that it goes to zero and then um, there's no exchange rate at which you can swap into dollars anymore. So that's a, that's an economic constraint, right? Um, I have another, I've been dancing around on this idea. I'm just trying to see what you guys think of this. So the, the real, so I'm always in this sort of, uh, in this complete contrast, um, Argentina versus US, right? I mean, actually, I think Argentina is quite, is always introducing new money into the system, but the big constraint that Argentina is facing is that its own population does not want to hold that money. Um, they're always trying to get out of that currency. The US, and that might be the, an economic constraint, not a political constraint. The economic constraint might be, hey, uh, the money that has been created is not being held, or people are using it immediately to get out of that currency. I think that's uh, uh, and that generates capital flows, of course, it generates um, other movements. But I'm just wondering if that's maybe the right place to start for an actual economic constraint. Yeah. Um, so that's that's even inside the, the constraint I was talking about, of course. You still have a currency and um, things aren't working. Certain things aren't working. Um, so I wonder if like what the, the value of the institutional tool is that it is unconstrained. Because I think what didn't work for the stabilization funds is because like they didn't provide maximum elasticity and like the need for it comes when you need elasticity it, and it is because like other mechanisms have failed. So it's like whatever, yeah. whatever constraint the system has a, as a whole, it's like whenever you need more than what exists. In other words, it's trying to induce everybody to believe that you should be holding, you should have trust in holding that currency um, and not move out of it, right? That's always the underlying, you're trying to keep people in in the inside money kind of, right? Um, and not and not have them go find some outside money of uh, generic sorts. Yeah, it's like you recruit, you enclose people inside and you just have enough sufficient flexibility and elasticity to do so. Yeah. So certainly there's value in um, the policy, like not being constrained in, in political terms, like not having, you know, hard limits baked into the tool or something like that. Um, but I think Jay is right that there are ultimately going to be some kinds of economic constraints. So it's not constrained on one level, um, but then it's still ultimately constrained uh, on, on another level, um, right? There's a limit to, to how far you can go. Um, yeah, I must say, because we, we danced around the issue about political constraint. Yeah, okay, the, the Fed uh, is somehow constrained by Congress or whatever at some point. But if you look at Argentina, um, I'm, just, I'm, I'm a novice on Argentina a little bit too, but they are introducing new money or they're trying to find a way to uh, use monetary policy to build social programs or whatever and, and spend. Uh, so the political constraint is not as strong as maybe the actual economic constraint of people wanting to hold the, their currency. Um, and that is maybe a good case that we should maybe look into more detail. We actually never talked about Argentina. I think that would be nice, nice for us to explore that, that case a little bit more. But um, I will just yeah. uh, one more comment. Um, so Argentina isn't trying to kind of fight deflationary pressures, right? That's not, uh, that's not the issue that they're having. Um, so if they if they were having that problem, then they could do what they're doing now to add some, some inflationary um, and devaluation -y, uh, uh, pressures to their situation. Um, I think if they want to um, curb inflation, what they're gonna have to do, and nobody wants to hold the, the currency, what they're gonna have to do is figure out a way to use their institutions to generate demand for the currency. And that could be as direct as, you know, um, you have to 
uh, pay the government taxes or fees or or something like that. Um, you know, the government has to go in and demand the currency, and and they might not have the option of uh, you know issuing their own uh, debt and 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 pulling uh, base money out of the economy that way because that debt is ultimately denominated in the same uh, uh, inflating unit. Um, maybe they could they could jack up interest rates high enough, but then I think that goes against their other goals of um, kind of. Uh, uh, you know, stimulating development and stuff and, and, and boosting employment and, and that kind of thing. And to bring it back to Larissa's point, um, I agree with it, what you, what you said, Alex. Larissa's point about the institutional unconstrained, the tool, the logic of the, the tool um, is that you are afraid of a cascading uh, default around in the payment system. You're afraid of that. You're trying to relax at, at a wholesale level, the settlement constraint in Perry's terminology, right? You're trying to make sure that people have a way to settle uh, and make, make payments. Um, and you don't want uh, one person to uh, have this sort of payment uh, default payment uh, trigger through the system, which is a different category of problem that you're trying to solve than the thing I was just mentioning, the people ultimately wanting to hold this thing for maybe a couple of weeks or months. This, and I think Argentina, I think if I remember correctly, maybe Bob, you know some details about this, but I think um, banking is, you know, I think it's 20% GDP or less that deposits account for something in, in Argentina. If you look at to any other country, that's extremely, um, extremely small, that number. I think, you, I'm not sure what the, what the ratios are in the US, but I'm sure they're 10 times, 20 times as large. Um, which also means that all savings are not being put in the banking system. They're all underneath somebody's bed in dollars or in other currencies. So I think there's, there's something about, there's no, there's no room to maneuver within the credit system of a country because people are not using the banking system at all. Anyway, we made a detour, but Bob, do you have any thoughts on any of this? I'm just, I was trying to bring you into that conversation a little bit with your experience. I think the question of what, what is the limit is, is, a, is a very uh, rich one. Uh, I think Alex is right to suggest that if the Fed were to choose the wrong counterparty and kind of look like it was losing money, that uh, the, the the instrument would would lose its force and credibility, or, or certainly could. Um, and so, I always thought it was a bit disingenuous for Bernanke to tell congressmen that there was essentially zero credit risk because we had the central bank standing between the U.S. Uh, central bank and the private banks. I mean, that was by way of saying there was no conceivable credit risk vis-a-vis -vis the central bank itself. And of course, history doesn't uh, support that. So it, it's, I, I think the conventional answer is, is the one that Jay gave, that it's political. I guess I've sort of given that answer myself, but it's a, it's a good, it's a good question. And but isn't the, the problem with that is that we don't necessarily have a good understanding of like the endogenous effect of credit credit risk. And, and I'm, I'm taking, you know, um, not including the situation where a country is irresponsible and there is an irresponsible leader, but in the situation where there is indeed uncertainty around the credit worthiness of the country, but you know that there is this binding constraint, this binding settlement constraint. Like the whole issue is that there, you know, you're potentially taking on credit risk, but the credit situation is definitively worse if you don't take it on. But there's no way of being sure when the situation, you know, is being defined by its uncertainty. Yeah, it's, it's interesting because certain parts of it are certain, right? Like you're swapping in and then you're swapping back at the same exchange rate. The question is whether there will be 
appreciation or depreciation in the meantime. Um, and I guess, well, I guess, the, I guess that that's credit risk too, because if they can't swap you back your own dollars, then, uh, then that's risk. Yeah. So I don't, I don't know what I'm saying. Can I ask a quick question here? So Larissa asked something on the lot on the first call that really spoke to me, which was uh, you asked Larissa if there was if anybody had a, a mental model, you know, for uh, a simplified mental model that that wasn't too simplified, but you know, substantially simple enough that you know we could hold it in our minds and use it to understand these kinds of things. And uh, offhand, at least, it didn't sound like anybody on the call knew that there was a you know an off the shelf ready to go, you know, mental model for this being offered within the world of economics. Uh, at least nobody was like, yeah, oh yeah, it's this model, you know. Um, the closest thing that I've run across in terms of someone trying to offer a simplified whole system model is really only at most, uh, really for a nation state, which is the, the uh, you know, the, the stock flow consistent models. I mean, they, they do have rest of world and all that kind of stuff, but I haven't seen any at least that have like 10, you know, countries going at the same time, you know, inside the model. And I'm curious, are there other attempts to offer, you know, a, a mental model besides, you know, that, that whole system that has, you know, uh, nested hierarchies of complexity so that you can go from high level simple in drill into more complex layers uh, besides that? Well, I think that's a big part of what uh, Perry Merling is trying to do. And, and that's um, kind of how, how Bob thinks about it as well. Instead of thinking, instead of emphasizing national borders, emphasizing, okay, there's all these balance sheets and they all interact with each other around the world. And then there are institutions that are responsible for managing different uh, instruments, uh, different currencies, that kind of thing. Um, but you're not kind of dividing everything up by, by country because really everyone's trading with each other. Yeah, and just to add to Alex, I think, um, I mean, I mentioned this to you yesterday already, but I think that another sort of uh, way that, ma that makes the, the problem more complex is that we're, we're obviously in a globalized economy that it has as a base, the Euro dollar, like the offshore dollar that's managed out of London. So we have institutional arrangements um, where there is no country per se in charge of the global money supply, right? Um, and, uh, and that is something um, that the Fed has only recently recognized that it actually is responsible in managing that and creating the swap lines and swap lines are basically a reaction to the fact that these institutions are largely outside the US that are uh, creating offshore dollars. So I think that's just creating another layer of complexity and getting off, off the um, off the national conversation is already super important because half of what Europe is doing is in um, is in Euro dollar or there's not there's there is not enough um, understanding of how this multi currency uh, situation actually plays out and that there's a hierarchy of currencies um, and I think you're exactly right the, and just another person I'd like to point you to in order just uh, before we start with a the model, then Jake's saying, hey, here's here's what we do based on the simplification. And then we sort of export that to other problems. That's a typical economist answer. We want to get away from that a little bit and just understand what is the actual uh, institutional landscape that actually is in front of us and how is the system actually functioning and how can we derive some logic uh, from that? And then you can decide, okay, based on that, do I want this or that intervention or that change? But uh, all these interventions half the time don't appreciate what's actually happening and how, for example, um, if you're trying to introduce capital controls in a modern economy like right now, then then you have this phenomena of Bitcoin and how do you control that? Actually, that's maybe what's going on in China right now. Uh, who knows? But doable. These, <laughs> we'll see what, what happens, but um, yeah. you always have uh, more, way more stuff than a mo these models tend to capture. And also, um, uh, long point. Let, Long story short, the paper I was just trying to refer you to in terms of who's scoping out this institutional setting for Europe, it's uh, Stefan Murau, who we read a couple of weeks ago as well, like it was already months now, uh, who wrote this paper, um, forget um, the exact uh, title. But... It's like the monetary architecture of 
the Eurozone within the international dollar system or something like that. Uh, Stefan, I'll, I'll find it. I'll link to you in the chat. Thank you. Yeah, and that's basically... And it's basically an institutional map, first and foremost, to understand how balance sheets interlink with each other at this wholesale system level. And then we can start the conversation how how that plays out in, in, in practice. So, yeah, I, I just want to clarify something that I just have discovered coming into the, the economics world, which is that when I talk about a mental model, um, I'm not actually talking about like an economic model, you know, in the sense that the, the economics models often mean like lots of mathematical formulas. Um, whereas mental model for me is just like, what's the picture, you know, that I can hold in my head, you know, that describes the relationship between things. You know, so for example, uh, discovering the national system of accounts was super powerful for me as giving me, uh, you know, a, a mental model for the balance sheets around the world. But interestingly, you know, if you look at the, the European, um, you know, system of accounts, it's 600 pages long and there's not a picture in it. There's a few tables, um, but they describe in 600 pages of words, a whole bunch of discrete relationships between entities and balance sheets without a single picture. So I had to make a picture. I had to like go through the document and actually build the mental picture of what they were describing, which is an awesome picture now that I have it, you know, but, uh, you know, just to the extent that I can find more mental models, not, uh, not necessarily mathematical models. Um, but just mental models for kind of like hanging all like as I'm listening to you all as a newbie to this conversation, you know, I'm, I'm there. I, I recognize the complexity. You know, I come from the sustainability world where complex systems, you know, dynamics is, is like, that's what it's all about. And, you know, that field has developed a lot of tools for handling complexity and for bounding it and, and you know, grouping it into feedback loops and boundaries and so on. And so I, I just feel confident that there has to be, you know, uh, some way to bound some of this complexity and put it into groups and boxes and boundaries and feedback loops and so on. And somebody's got to have done that, uh, but maybe not. I don't know. So I think one of the tricky things is that uh, macroeconomics is very much not settled and monetary economics is very much not settled. Um, so it's not like there's, you know, the experts Experts all agree, and it's just a communication problem or something like that. Um, I think, you know, mm -hmm. at the beginning, I heard you say, you know, I want to have the right to understand this stuff. Um, and that's, you know, I, I don't think there's anyone trying to stand in the way of anyone understanding it. I think there's a lot of people uh, trying to understand uh, the international, the global economy, right? Um, so what, what we're not limited by um, kind of uh, you know, some elite holding, holding people back from understanding what we're limited by is like, are, are, do we have enough people who are actually interested in, in trying to figure this out and are they going the right direction? You know, that kind of thing. Um, so, you know, a lot of people have developed different, different models and, and they often disagree with each other. Um, and it's an interesting distinction you draw between, you know, a mental model and an economic model. Um, I think there are some economists who would say that it's all economic models, even the one you hold in your head. Um, it's just a matter of, you know, like, how, like you said, uh, and, you know, uh, Jay is talking about like going out there and seeing what's actually out there. But I like, I like the approach of like, trying to distill down to just what you need to explain the thing. Um, it's hard, though, if the thing is really complicated. Um, but I like that approach. I, I like the approach of not going out there and looking at the real world and thinking about, well, what do I want an ideal world to look like? And then once you've understood that, once you really have an idea of how that looks and how that's how that works and all the incentives and you know everything works in your in your mental model, then you can compare it to the real world and you'll have some kind of anchor to compare it against or something. But uh, that's that's kind of my my preferred way of, of thinking about it. Yeah, and I have lots of thoughts. I shared my email so we can take this offline um, and talk through. Okay. Thank you, Larissa. I, actually, I didn't. I don't think I got your email address. On on chat. Yeah, I see several uh, things. Up oh, there it is. Sorry, it was up above. Someone else has got some things in there. Great. Thank you. Yeah, like I warned you at the beginning, I have a couple minutes left before I have to drop off at quarter past. But I made Alex co-host in case you are super eager to keep the conversation going. Um, but just to finish the conversation on mental model, um, I think there's a real problem uh, that people have 
in understanding the intuition of balance sheets. Uh, primarily economists who are actually, actually tasked uh, with, with balance sheets. If it's not, uh, if you haven't spent your life in these institutions like Bob has, I think it's really difficult to get this intuition uh, and the implications. And this is actually what this book is also about. Like, like just bring it to the final chapter and the conclusion, I've said this now three times already. Um, how, can, how could the Great Depression have been so large? None of these problems we're talking about are um, so large, but money has within it system collapse at a wholesale level. So it's a fundamental property of what we're doing. It's not just one other thing, one more good we add to, uh, to the X good, right? So, um, and it has something to do with what Perry calls the survival constraint. When that, uh, when that liquidity kills you quick, if you don't, you're not able to pay, you are default. You are, as an economic unit, um, uh, uh, so to speak, dead, and that's, and that's sort of um, that could freeze the entire system, the everything we're we're understanding, and this was actually came out yesterday as well. Just like to draw the analogy that Mark Paul in yesterday's debate brought up, which was um, he was describing climate as a as a similar fundamental property that's going that's even more fundamental than just one more good or one more variable in in an equation of others, which was criticizing Nordhaus, and he's just saying, okay. In these climate catastrophes, that's going to cost us eight, eight percent of GDP, and that's the calculation he's making. No, no, we're talking about system collapse. Like these are things where there's a there's a there's something the the entirety of the the construct could be um, coming down if we don't understand the implications of what in this case money and in, in yesterday's conversation climate could have for the system at large. Um, and that's kind of what we were digging through to try to figure out what are these links and. Uh, the collapse of balance sheets, like the collapse of money and the means of payment uh, is something that we're trying to figure out how to stabilize, especially in a globalized economy. We figured out for our nation states, I think we've had the institution of central banks, uh, but the market has gone beyond nation states for since, since forever. And now we have to coordinate money at the global level. And there's only very few actors that can stabilize the system. Um, in this case, we're talking that... Um, how this cooperation actually broke down for a number of reasons. And I think we should maybe focus the, on the last chapter, the last couple of words before I leave. Yeah, I just um, want to quickly say that I think a lot of the people here would recommend uh, starting with that Perry Maryland course and really kind of uh, internalizing the, the balance sheet uh, framework. But yeah, let's get into the last chapter. Jay, go ahead. So who wants to start? Why don't you start since you have to go? Okay, so um, yeah, for me, for me, I already said, I already kind of said it. Um, he kind of summarizes it. for me the two. And there's multiple sub chapters here, but the main, the main thing for me is um, he is mostly concerned about central bank cooperation. I think that's sort of the thing that. Uh, that he stand that he puts puts forward, and what stood in the way of that happening is the U.S. recognizing, uh, not recognizing that it had a role to play. As uh, Larissa said, there's a Gestalt switch, switch from being in a me mentally a small country that's participating in the system at large to being the system, the country that is the system, if if you will, uh, and it has to sort of uh, be a leader in. And largely, like the difference is exactly uh, how it played out later after World War II, where the Marshall Plan is basically the U.S. Uh, also extending a lot, of, a lot of a lot of credit, basically, and basically putting the system on its back and being using its liability side of, uh, to to make the system go uh, and work. And uh, also, how we've we've seen the system now be saved in 2008 and 2000, and, and currently in the responses where the Fed has been sort of the, the lender and dealer of last resort, not just for the US, but for the world. Uh, and the other thing, yeah, those are the two big points that I just wanted to put right in front of us. I think that's pretty much what, what he emphasizes in my opinion. There's yeah, also other sub chapters. With uh, cooperation, he's emphasizing that you can't just have a bunch of central banks cooperating with each other. There needs to be um, you know, a leader. It's it's not it's not about cooperation or it is about cooperation, but the cooperation has to take the form of someone's taking the lead, someone's kind of in charge of this whole thing, and everyone else is following. Uh, so there's this kind of um, the system's not going to work 
uh, and it's not or it's not going to be stable uh, unless you have some kind of central hegemon uh, kind of managing uh, the whole system, and then you have the, a hierarchy of, of central banks. Um, and it's not um, it's not a choice, you know the the central bank that um, you know is issuing the currency that everyone else uses. Um, that's the central bank that has the responsibility to manage the international system as a whole. And this is what Jay was mentioning before, is that, you know, the Fed is finally starting to figure out that, that maybe they have to do more of that. Um, and so it's up to them. There's nothing anyone else can do. And something Kindleberger emphasizes is that uh, during the Depression, um, you know, the uh, England was used to being in this leadership position and they knew how to do it. Um, but they were not uh, set up for it anymore. They didn't have uh, uh, the right the right balance sheet for it anymore. Uh, you know, the United States had all the gold after World War One, and blah 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 is oversimplification. But the United States was the one that was in the position to uh, set everything right, and they didn't want to. They were still acting as if, okay, we're gonna we're gonna put our own people first, um, and then it, it didn't. Uh, uh, you know, we had a we had a worldwide depression uh, that was deeper and and maybe longer than it should have been. Um, so, so yeah, he's emphasizing the leadership, not just the cooperation. Um, and the, there's three dimensions that he lists, um, that are, that the leader should be responsible for, which is one, maintaining a relatively open market for distressed goods, B, providing counter cyclical long-term lending. So lender of last resort, that kind of thing, uh, and dis discounting in crisis. Um, I guess counter cyclical long-term lending is not lender of last resort, Dis discounting in crisis is lender of last resort, or maybe they both are different dimensions of it. Um, but yeah, so he wants the United States to be doing this. He wanted the United States to be doing this during the depression, and he wants the United States to be doing this, um, or he wants someone to be doing this during the 1970s when it looks like uh, maybe to, from his perspective, writing during the time, it looks like maybe the United States is is losing their position as kind of the de facto leader and who's that leader going to be um, and and do they have to step up, that kind of thing. Obviously, it stayed the United States. We, did, we didn't have a problem there, um, but he was imagining a, a problem. The, the question that I have after reading this is if, is it about leadership or like ability and rapidness or like velocity of response. So it seems like for the three things that they want, like the market for distressed good, counter cyclical lending, discounting crisis, is that about leadership or is that about, about institutions? And on the, in, on the fact that it's like leadership, not cooperation, is it just that cooperation takes time and without a leader, you, there's, you know, it's not something that he goes into, but that's just been something that has been on my mind. Yeah. Um, so I guess the question you're asking, is it a matter of like someone has to take initiative in order to get things done? Uh, and maybe it's not as important who that is as long as it's someone. Is this, that kind of what you're saying? It's about there being, uh, I, I think it was like to... Bye, 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 Jay. Bye, Jay. <laughs> Uh, to the point of, is it cooperation or is it leadership, right? And I think is it is it is he arguing that there was not um, cooperation because there was no leadership? I think it's or is there a means of getting cooperation? If you get cooperation, if there are other means besides leadership to get cooperation. I think it's um, it's not not cooperation. It's just that the cooperation is structured in a particular way, where someone's the leader and and other people are are following. And there's really one set of institutions or one institution that's in a position to claim the leadership. Uh, and if you're if you're in that position and you don't recognize it, um, it's going to cause problems or something like that. Oh, go ahead. I think, think one uh, aspect of leadership that he is clear about is that the leader is is willing to bear costs to achieve the, the the social good so as opposed to the the sort of exorbitant privileged view of the world where the 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 hegemon uh exploits the position to enhance its own welfare uh 
Uh, Kindleberger's story is 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 more like Olson and Zeckhauser on NATO from uh, a generation ago, where the Denmarks of the world, which know that their defense spending has no consequence for the aggregate capacity of NATO, you know, sort of free ride, and the and the big guys, of course, uh, the big the big guys pay disproportionate cost of 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 the alliance, and, and so that's. That's his model of of leadership, a, a sort of willingness to bear costs uh, to to achieve the the social good. Yeah, because I guess the way that I could um, to make my question more precise is: there a way to create some governance system that takes that replaces leadership? Um, because it ensures some sharing of costs, it ensures a sufficiently quick response. This is purely theoretical. I think in practice, you know, you need leadership just because these things are too complex and take too much time that in practice, like a crisis would go forth, but I'm just trying to explore if are you there is about... something around like the qualities of leadership or are or what qualities can be, you know, captured in an institutional arrangement, and what can't? Are you asking about setting up uh, a global institution to manage the system, or are you asking about uh, cryptocurrency? I guess either, because ultimately, is it about can there be some institutional mechanism that? enables like quick and adaptive response and sharing of costs um, in a way that, you know, supports the system from moving across, or moving beyond like these um, like points of like settlement breakdowns. I think, I think in World in Depression, Kindleberger is very clear that the institution that the US Treasury set up uh, after World War II, uh, the IMF was constitutionally ill-suited to be the international lender of last resort. It was it was too slow. Uh, it it uh, had had constraints on on size. It 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 was disqualified in three ways uh, in in his account. And and he makes a, a clear case that if if we had uh, in the early 70s something that resembled the international lender last resort, it was the swap uh, network. And it's very uh, good forecast, in fact, because at the time the swaps were sort of limited against how much could ultimately be drawn from the IMF. So the British, the swaps on, on behalf of the UK government uh, Bank of England rather were limited by the UK Treasury's draw on on the IMF, and so it's only in in recent years that we've seen the sort of decoupling of the swap sizes and the IMF sort of backstop, and and you know it's 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 now far clearer uh, what Kindleberger argued at the at the time. Uh, back in back in the early '70s, that the, the international lender of last resort is this semi-institutionalized uh, swap network, rather than something with articles of agreement and and a long legal history and and annual meetings and so on. And I guess the the fact that it's unlimited, um, you know, in terms of how it's uh, uh, politically structured, uh, is what allows it to be instantaneous. Because you just go onto the swap line and and swap the money you need. Um, so that's what gets around kind of the the lag, right? You know, you, even even if you take the the SDR, they're now being sort of handed out uh, in a in a rather large. Uh, issue, but if you ask yourself how how long does it take to turn an SDR into real money, the answer is at least days. Uh, whereas a swap 
network operates at the speed of ours. Yeah, and I guess like the current arrangement of the swap lines is still very dependent on like US leadership and discretionary power. So it is exactly like the the system that Kindleberger replaced, but could there be an alternative? And I guess an alternative would only make sense. If so you're saying that the swap network is really uh, an extension of the Fed, because even though it swaps, people are really borrowing mostly from the Fed. That's kind of what you're getting at. Yeah, I think that's an uncontroversial view. Uh, yeah, yeah. I, but then the question is, um, what do we do instead of that? Um, or how do we get to uh, a similar system that is maybe not uh, politically influenced by the interests of one particular nation or something like that? Um, is that kind of what you're getting at? Yeah, which I think would only, you know, as a theory, purely theoretical exercise, would only have consequences in the real world if there were some other um, currency or monetary unit that had the role that the dollar plays today. Or, the, or it was put on top of it. Or right? the Fed could um, uh, evolve into uh, an international uh, institution that is no longer beholden to the United States. Also true. When I think about, you know, uh, the Bank of England, um, you know, I guess, you, you know, they started, they had, they had special privileges, they were lending to the um, to the crown, but they um, they were doing it for a profit, and then they kind of evolved into this this role of um, you know kind of managing the whole the whole system. Um, so can you can you have an evolution like that? Uh, except instead of evolving from being among the private banks to being among the, to being a central bank, evolving from being among the central banks to being the central bank above all the other central banks, or something like that. I like that as a provocative idea. So I might, I might yeah. remind you that Kindleberger was of the view that uh, a European should be should join the Federal Open Market Committee. Oh right, yeah. So he, he kind of wanted to push in that direction, and I guess that would kind of uh, be you know. Uh, the swap lines certainly look like at least the Fed placing itself above everyone else um, or acknowledging that they are above everyone else. Um, and then the, and then getting the kind of the political impartiality. Yeah. You'd, you'd have to get some Europeans and other people from other countries uh, going on the board of the Fed. And then you'd have to kind of revise the, um, you know, the, the charter of the Fed to not be U S specific, that kind of thing. Um, yeah. But I wonder if like you could break the Fed instead. If you could break the like, Fed instead in a good way. Yeah. Okay. Like um, split up those roles and responsibilities, move. Oh, I see. Like breaking up a monopoly kind of type situation. Yeah. Have a part that's responsible for like swap lines and then have a part that's more domestically focused. And one that looks, you know, Euro dollar market was in the international side of the house. And then. The problem is that you're still talking about the same monetary unit. Um, all these different divisions are still working on uh, dollar denominated assets and the interest rates on those assets um, are connected through money markets, right? Um, so if you're gonna, gonna get a better interest rate on uh, you know, Euro dollars then, or, or whatever, right? There's, there's always this kind of arbitrage uh, stuff going on. So if you, if you are managing the dollar unit and you're managing monetary policy for the United States and interest rates for the United States, that's going to, to kind of bleed over into um, you know, the offshore dollars and, and all of that, right? Unless you purposely create frictions so that it doesn't. Yeah, I'm not liking where this is going. <laughs> uh, well, this is just, you know, if I like to, 
yeah. understand like where where are the where yeah what are what are the true forces and like what could you know how could it look different yeah i mean no matter what frictions you create you're still in a situation where there's you know people are denominating their assets and liabilities in a way that's ultimately an iou for um kind of domestic United States currency. So you have to make it not, not a United States specific currency all the way at the top of the hierarchy, right? Like, do you, um, if you had tighter controls and you had, um, if you tracked movement of where the currency is, you would just basically make domestic versus international USDs non-fungible, which you could do with the central bank digital currency. I see. So, so what you're saying is in much the same way that the dollar went off gold, the international dollar could go off the dollar. And you'd have a separate or, currency. Yeah, I guess in that sense, would it even make sense to call it the same currency? Uh, no. Yeah. then perhaps this would just be a first step into creating like a something on top of the dollar. Yeah, yeah, I, yeah. I guess a question we can ask is kind of what's the path of least resistance to getting there? Um, do we want to, um, do we want the Fed itself to evolve into this global institution or do we want to insert a new institution below the Fed um, that manages the international dollars and then it, uh, detaches itself from that hierarchy and then becomes the international money or something like that. Um, I'm, I'm imagining by analogy to gold. Um, yeah. Uh, Larissa, for, forgive me, but uh, briefly, how does the central bank digital currency change the possibility of uh, making the offshore dollar and onshore dollar non deliverable, non-fungible? Oh, by just tracking where it is geographically. And you can say like, this is a domestic US dollar and this is an international one. So by calling it, you know, by different names, you allow there to be um, differentiated like targeting. And you could, you could change, for example, acceptability. If like, oh, you're in the US, you will need to take these certain steps to convert your international dollar to your domestic dollar. And you basically force the creation of markets separating the US, your domestic and your international ones, which creates a possibility of a different price. So I'm trying to wrap my head around the idea that a dollar can have a geographic location. Um, oh, this is, it's just by, by technology, technology can just like track the location, right? So like which, which a computer system is the dollar being recorded on? Yeah. You would need, of course, this, I'm not saying that this is like trivial, you would have like a series of complicated steps and procedures around what counts as domestic versus not like if you're an italian you know investing in a u.s firm are you doing you know in what way will would that be domestic versus international but i'm just saying theoretically the technology makes it possible for you to add like a a series of standards that differentiate between like a domestic and an international dollar is is i guess I'm, I'm still trying to to figure out what it is that you're trying to make possible so differentiating between two currencies um sure so there's a you know in the sense that there's a difference between um gold 
bullion in the vault of the central bank and a gold note that claims some gold coins. Exactly. These are two different and instruments. So because there's dues in a slightly different ways, like their acceptability is a little bit different. They have slightly different prices. Right. And they so, have like different de demand functions. So the onshore dollars are the bullion, the offshore dollars are the certificates, the gold certificates by, by analogy. And then eventually you're getting to a point where the gold certificates are no longer IOUs for the bullion. Is that where you're getting at? Yeah, or you can just, um, basically you create, um, by making them non-fungible, you will change the relative demand of the boolean and the coin right because that's like some of what we had seen in like making of money is that you know the cost to transport the cost to to transfer like the terminant uses like all of that de determines like the um the price of boolean and then that's different than the price of gold as coin Right, so like the introduction of a, of a friction, you know, uh, right. and rules well, around like acceptability will mean that those two um, coins have different demand functions and therefore potentially different prices that you can then manipulate. So we already live in a world where the offshore dollars are different instruments from the onshore dollars. So it sounds to me like what you want to do is um, make the difference more stark or um, I guess it's what you mean by, by adding friction. So it's harder to redeem your offshore dollars for onshore dollars um, or there's you know some process that you have to go through that's not, uh, it, it prevents it from, from redeeming at par or something like that. Yeah. Uh, yeah, you know, I think that's kind of you'd have to you'd you'd have to take the step where I think you're right. You'd have to take, take the step where there is this standardized instrument that people are using day to day internationally, um, and they use it so much, and they barely ever redeem it for what's above it in the hierarchy. So that when you kind of sever that tie, um, nobody really notices. Like when you leave the gold standard, nobody notices because nobody's actually transacting in gold anyway. That kind of thing. Um, I think that's that that makes sense to me. So maybe you could use. Um, I don't know that it needs to be CBDC in particular, but if you have kind of the standardized instrument that, that people are using uh, as money, um, that, you know, that's what you have to do. Is that kind of what you're getting at? Yeah. yeah. No, so I was just, you know. <laughs> I mean, right now it's, right now the offshore dollars are, it's basically. It's a fun little brainstorming of like how we so. could, yeah. Well, this is just like a fun brainstorming on how we reserve system, the reserve currency of the world. Yeah. Okay. Um, I'll have to think about that a little bit more. Um, I tend to kind of by default imagine uh, that the dollar is that currency. We just need to um, get our institutions right to, to manage it uh, for the global economy instead of instead of uh, targeting America specifically. Um, but. But yeah, I mean, I can I can imagine this this scenario of 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 graduating from the dollar just the way we graduated from from gold. Um, yeah, and it's it's interesting. So on the point around local versus like international currency, so this is something that China is exploring, like the technological feasibility of at least um, limiting its central bank digital currencies to like its geographical boundaries, which could potentially you know, create, have some effect around the, the relative demand of like a domestic versus international remnant B, but the remnant B is like very, you know, it's a it has a specific use in the national, international monetary order. And it seems from everything that we've heard from Rob that China is not that interested in being the reserve currency of the world. On the other hand, there are all of these projects looking to uh, create some multi CBDC system that um, improves cross-border settlement. Yeah, so my sense is that 
um, it's always going to be a little bit of a whack-a-mole type situation because you you create this barrier and then markets form form to get around that that kind of thing and that's of course how we got the euro dollar the offshore dollar system in the first place is that we had um, regulations about where dollars could go uh, so people started creating dollar denominated instruments you know in Europe um, uh, but that did create this division right between onshore dollars and offshore dollars. Um, yeah, uh, because ultimately, whatever whatever currency you're talking about, people are not people are at least the way things are now. People are not transacting directly in in the base money. They're you know um, borrowing and issuing instruments that are denominated in that currency. That um, you can't control. You can't control where where the, those instruments go. Right? Like if you have uh, an offshore do U.S. dollar CBDC token. Um, and and you just pass me a paper, piece of paper that says IOU one offshore CBDC token, and I pass it around onshore in the United States. Um, you know I can do that uh, unless unless I'm being tracked by regulations. That that little piece of paper, like you know, like we can do whatever we want, right? We can make agreements and not record them on balance sheets uh, and that kind of thing. And then I can take the piece of paper and eventually when I want to buy something. Uh, from someone uh, offshore, uh, then I hand them the piece of paper, and then they get the offshore dollar from you, right? You, you get you, you know, uh, kind of the the whole correspondent banking thing. Um, but yeah, um, I don't know. I don't know if CBDC is a specific. I don't know if that specifically gets us more than just kind of thinking about um, what already happened with with going off gold or even the emergence of the euro dollar market in the first place yeah no i think it's it's useful just like as a um a thought exercise of yeah. what could be like a a path towards something like this and like what you know what might happen that could lead us um to um lead us there yeah so i mean so so right now most of the offshore dollars the offshore dollar money market, that's the repo market. Um, of course it happens onshore as well, but that, that's the modern version. Like we don't have these Euro dollar time deposits anymore, which is what the offshore dollar market looked like before 2008. Um, so maybe what you're imagining is kind of turning the repo market into a CBDC or some kind of to to token. Oh, and, I, and I guess it's, it's more around like does, so then the, the more abstracted away question um is to what extent the non fungibility of money is apparent and i guess the euro there's no differentiation between like a domestic and an international dollar in the repo market right the repo market just by the, the just repo the instruments themselves are the in international dollars the the yeah you hold those repos as uh as deposits right yeah but i think you also use repo for your onshore dollars as well or no uh yeah you use them onshore and offshore but they're at a yeah. le level of the hierarchy below the the domestic dollar that's right yeah but kind of like the the management of domestic dollars like happens you know across different levels of the hierarchy. So there's not like a clean, there's not clean separability between the onshore dollars and the offshore dollars. It's not, right, it's not separated geographically, it's separated conceptually. The repo is an IOU for an on, for a- Yes, an but even dollar. with the repo, yeah. it's not like fully separable. There's not a market that is exclusive to the Euro dollar that you then with some institution that connects it to the domestic dollar. Not sure I'm following. The repo is the Euro dollar. It is inclusive of the Euro dollar was my understanding. It's not identical to the Euro dollar market. It's inclusive of. I was I was thinking more that it's identical to the to the Euro dollar market. The Euro dollar market is the repo market now. And you can use euro dollars domestically, and that just 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 using the repo market. Maybe maybe I maybe there's something I'm missing, but but my sense is that that's. But it's not um, exclusive. 
it's kind of my understanding is like the euro dollar market is contained in the repo market, but the repo market has more uses than just the euro dollar market. Uh, how are you defining the euro dollar market? Um, so I guess it's um, dollar deposits by um, people abroad. So it has to be by people abroad. Yeah, or something something to denote the fact that what's the offshoreness, if not the who who holds the account. Yeah, I mean, I think the the offshoreness is a reference to the fact that people use it offshore uh, in the sense that you know, like when we talk about euro dollar, it's not all in Europe. It's you know, that's just kind of where it got the name from because that's where these instruments were first being traded in like London and then stuff. What, I guess, what is the Euro dollar to you? Repo. Oh, okay. So the reason that I'm honing in on like offshore account or yeah. offshore branch is because I am interested in whether or not there is a separability between an onshore dollar and an offshore dollar. So I am interested in a definition. I don't think repo markets are used exclusively by people abroad or, or right. to, to transact deposits held abroad. Right. And um, I think I think that's also true of what we traditionally called a, a euro dollar market. Um, or the euro dollar deposits. I guess they were primarily yes. in Europe, but um, it was more um, technically speaking, it was defined by what kind of instrument it is, not where it was. It just happened to be that, yeah. that Europe didn't have access but if to the accounts. You, that had, right? Yeah. But if you're interested in, in this dynamic between a national versus an international dollar, then you need a definition of what counts as an international dollar. Do we already exist in a world where there is a differentiation between a national and an international dollar, where those dollars actually in practice have different prices? And uh, it's like somewhat but the repo market, if it were exclusive, exclusively an international dollar market, then yes, but it's like both international and national dollars. I think we use the term international dollar to describe a dollar that can be used anywhere. Uh, and we use the term uh, domestic dollar to describe, um, okay, now you've got, um, you're, you're a bank and you have a reserve account at the Fed and, and you're, dollars are domestic dollars. Your reserves are domestic dollars. Um, yeah, and cash as well. Yeah, but those two but dollars are fungible. This. Well, it's, it's always gonna be fungible if they trade it. One's an IOU for the other, right? So as long as there's no stress on the system and they trade roughly at par, then, then yeah, they're pretty, pretty fungible. Um, obviously, if I'm a bank uh, out, offshore uh, outside of the United States, I can't have a deposit account at the Fed. So uh, my reserves, uh, my dollar reserves are not gonna be in, um, in domestic US dollars. They're gonna be in uh, repo. Yeah, so use, use the repo, but you're not the only person, you, like only type of institution using the repo markets. Right, there are domestic institutions exactly. using repo markets as well. Yes. Um, yeah, I guess the uh, the definition of international dollar doesn't mean that the dollars have to be international. It means that they they can be used. They, it's an instrument that can be used internationally, whereas the reserve accounts at the Fed are uh, restricted to domestic institutions. Yeah, I don't. I I guess are we. Uh... It sounds like you want to create an instrument that has this kind of geographic property to it. Um, and that's not my sense, that's not in line with what I typically think of as Euro dollars or offshore dollars or the international dollar. Um, 
it what I'm interested in exploring is whether there could be a demarcation between a domestic dollar and an international dollar. I don't think that that demarcation exists in any. And you want to. Do I don't this. think that they're. Um, and you want to do this partly as just as, like as to explore what could be an institutional path towards differentiating those two instruments to create like an international currency yeah. based on the international dollar. So it's like okay. a very limited theoretical exercise. I have to think more. Um, but it was just an ex yeah. Sorry, I think I think we're breaking up a little bit. Uh, I have to think about more uh, about what. Oh what that means um, because certainly if you if you don't care about the geographic distinction you can still create this break right um, we had gold domestically but it was also the international currency and we um, we broke off gold there's no reason why you can't have um, you know an instrument that's an IOU for dollars that that breaks off the dollar or that leaves the dollar standard um, I don't know I don't know why the geographic uh, distinction would be important, and I'm not entirely sure what it what it means, other than oh, just yeah. like for the purely political reason, that the reason that um, from like a political perspective, the U.S. is used as a reserve currency, although it's the national currency of the U.S. Um, it is used to denominate a number of different contracts like held abroad. So this is this is more in the exploration of if we were to go, you know, in that very corner theoretical case of moving towards a world where there's some acceptable um, international standard that is different than the dollar and thinking through that path, there is going to be like part of the impetus is political part of the acceptability is you know grounding it in something that is used today right so the geographical dimension matters just from like a political perspective like you want to ground it in international dollars because it's its use as an international reserve currency so you're a politician and you want to go out and say to the people hey we're doing this thing um specifically with stuff that only affects the international dollar or something like that yeah okay i feel like a lot of a lot of cryptocurrency is is like that it's so you can say say you're doing something that sounds like it means something to to lay people or something like that i mean <laughs> I don't know. that is all of communication all yeah. we do is yeah. you know articulate our ideas in ways that will be persuasive to others yeah so i guess we can separate um the discussion of of what's persuasive to the people from you know how it actually works um, yeah because because i think part yeah. of the motivation was also around like if we were to if we were to break up the fed in what way would that idea even make sense like if there were some component of the fed that was looking at a domestic dollar and some component of the fed that looked at at the international dollar, what is it that each of those parts of the Fed would be looking at? Well, in order to truly break it up, these two dollars can't be connected to each other anymore. The international dollar can no longer be an IOU for the domestic dollar, right? It would have to be like, oh, there's the US dollar and there's the Canadian dollar and there's the Australian dollar and there's the international dollar and these are all different currencies. Like, do you need to... Um, because they're IOUs, can't you just manipulate how much you have to hold of one versus the other? I mean, there's ways to cause stresses in uh, money markets that, that are gonna drive interest rates apart. Is that kind of what you're getting at? Or there's still a, a par value. There's still a face value on the instrument, right? It's like, a, you know, this is a $10, um, uh, international dollar instrument that's an IOU for 10, 10 regular dollars. 
unless you break, unless you, you sever the link. Yeah, and I guess like, what would you do to sever the link? So this, this is what I'm trying to say, like, what yeah, would you call I mean, a domestic dollar versus an international dollar? Like, what could you? I don't know if I would call it international versus domestic. I might, you know, uh, I, I mean, I, I imagine it would look something like how we left the gold standard, like the international um, economy is using uh, something that's an IOU for dollars, but they never actually redeem the dollars. And then we just kind of say, okay, it's no longer redeemable for dollars. It's its own unit now. Yeah. Yeah. And then you have your own institution managing that. It could be a a branch off of the Fed or something that's no longer connected to the Fed. You sever that tie too as well. Yeah. Uh, I want to talk to you more about this, uh, but we're 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 way over time. Yes, and we, it was like way a, a way tangent from the world <laughs> yeah. of the depression. Uh, I wanted to say one more thing about uh, this book and the last chapter. Um, you know, he's imagining that individual countries uh, looking out for themselves uh, aren't going to cut it. Um, I'm not convinced of that. I think it depends on um, what you what what you mean by looking out for yourself. Like he's imposed some political constraints here. Like governments can't run budget deficits, right? They have to maintain balanced budgets, and that's like very important to them politically. If you don't have that restriction. It's not that hard to, um, you know, boost prices using fiscal policy or to prevent deflation uh, using fiscal policy, and you can do that in a way that doesn't hurt anyone internationally, uh, because you're just instead of uh, instead of uh, keeping uh, interest rates lower for the benefit or well, I don't know. I have to think about this more, but I, 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 I have a hunch that if you, if you allow countries to just print enough money to ensure there's enough demand within their economies, um, that you know, you're not gonna have, uh, I think each country could handle, I, I, I think it's better to have an international system and an international currency, um, but I think you can prevent something like the Great Depression uh, by just telling each country, hey, you know, like, if you want, want higher prices, uh, spend more money into the economy and tax less, some combination of that, um, ensure that consumers have, have more, more money to spend uh, and then, then they'll spend it and that'll, that'll prop up prices. It'll ensure there's enough money flow. Um, and then internationally, you know, that'll affect you know, how much spending you have to do to, to get to the right levels. But um, it, it doesn't strike me as that much of a problem if you allow that. I don't know, because I think it will, I need to think it through, but won't it impact like your um, exchange rate and it'll impact exports it and imports. And I kind of, th that is when it becomes like a little bit of like a political mess and that there might be like race to the bottom as one country reacts to another. The question is, um, yeah, so it does affect all those things. The question is whether you actually get that race to the bottom um, or beggar thy neighbor uh, type effect. Uh, and, and my sense is that you wouldn't. If, you're, if you are spending more money into your economy that and other countries aren't, say you're the only country that's, that's doing this crazy you know, money printing scheme, um, then other countries, um, you're going to be able to buy more input, imports from other countries until they raise their prices. And it feels like it wouldn't create this kind of um, race to the bottom type situation, right? And then, and then if they decided to do it as well, that just kind of balances it out. It's not, you know, uh, it doesn't force you to do it more or something, right? If, if, they, if they, if so if, say there's two countries, if, if I'm country A and I start printing money and everybody can buy all this stuff and we're importing more from country B because we're, we're you know, we have more money to spend. Um, now country B implements the same policy, that's, also going to have an effect in the same direction for me. It's going to, um, you know, reduce the exports that they send to me. It's going to, uh, it's going to also be be inflationary for me if other people are doing it right. Um, it's not going. It's not like oh they've counteracted what I did domestically by doing the same thing on their end, and now I have to do it even more or something like that. 
I, if anything, I'd have to pull back. I think it will. I think it will depend. Do you think I need to? I need to think. I'll All think right. about it. So that's the thought. So like we'll, we need to. Uh, yeah, we'll I need to. On. Yeah. Have a drop at two. All right. I'm gonna stop. Stop the recording now. Great. So we do rise of carry next.